Again. Okay. We're starting new, aren't we? Because I really couldn't what find. What the hell? You have to pardon see. us. We seem to be having technological difficulties. Technological. Yeah, I said that right. <laughs> Tech two. Te technical, technological. Technical. We have them all. Technically, they're difficulties. Hey, you got a letter over there, too. No, I sure do, don't I? Now, this is a game by... Motherfucker. <laughs> this is a game by Motherfucker. I've never heard of that company. <laughs> Ray, can you tell us something about them? <laughs> they're banned by the ESRB rating system. <laughs> Uh, we may not be able to play this. Wait. Game. Wait. In a world covered by endless water. It's Waterworld. <laughs> That's right. Kevin Costner is in this game. Okay, this is uh, an interesting take on Mega Man. This is um, their attempt to move the series Mega into 3D. Not a smart choice. Well, maybe a smart choice, but not executed properly. Now, an interesting story on this is that um, Sony didn't want them to do Mega Man the way, the, you know, the way it had been done for years. They actually were pushing them to do 3D on their console. They wanted something 3D on the system. And that was one of the main things is why you'll see a lot of good 3D games on it. Because they basically mandated to most developers that they had to do it in 3D. Yeah, they uh, they were the system was capable of doing it. They really wanted to show off that power, and uh, with the competing N64, which could do 3D quite easily, uh, they wanted to show that off. Now, uh, while we're on that topic, let's go ahead and just kind of go into the the tech specs on this machine. Um, it was a 32-bit uh, MIPS uh, RISC chip running at 33 megahertz. What it does that mean to us? It was pretty beefy. Um, it it was it wasn't as powerful as personal computers at the time, but um, it, it was uh, pretty close. It was a pretty powerful computer. But not only that, uh, the MIPS processor had special engines built onto it to help with processing. So uh, they had a, a true 3D system, uh, and there was the geometry engine, and that is what helped push the polygons. And Sony, of course, always kind of exaggerates numbers with things. Uh, they, they give best possible circumstance numbers. And under best possible circumstance, the PS1 was supposedly able to do 1.5 million polygons a second, 500,000 uh, polygons if they were textured or lighted, like you'd see in a game environment such as this. Uh, but in reality, it did between 100,000 and 300,000 polygons textured or not just you know depending on what the game could do and what you know how well it was programmed but at the time that was very impressive uh, that was a lot of polygons and a lot of texture uh, to be able to show and you see here the the textures are kind of bland and mundane in this but you know everything is textured it's not like uh, a lot of the early Saturn and a lot of the 3d stuff that we saw where it was just blank polygons yeah, um, they really started pushing textures, and they look bland to us now because we've been introduced to the wonderful world of texture mapping, where you can put, um, you know, you can just have finer textures and everything. Well, I mean, basically at this point, they just get large libraries of textures and pick and choose what they want. I mean, it's... It really comes down to the powerfulness of the newer stuff. Yeah, at this time, a lot of it was still put on the developer's hands and the 3D engines had to be built from the ground up and the textures had to be created by their graphic artists and it all had to be done in-house. Whereas now, uh, the middleware stuff is almost... 
its own industry it's essentially yeah uh, you know helping to create today's games but uh you know back to the ps1's power um you know it had gpu and sound press processing that was far beyond what we'd seen on previous consoles it had great uh 3d or uh, uh cd audio which we had heard but you know they really you know here we hear some voice in the game there was a lot of that a lot of uh voice acting a lot of high quality music and uh unfortunately the voice the voice acting ended up being low quality <laughs> yeah that they couldn't make up for the quality of the the actor <laughs> um but you know it was somewhere to start it you know it, they got that b it was it was better than the b movie stuff on the sega cd and that we'd seen previously on yeah, other that, systems and that actually turned out to be kind of a positive for them because people looked back at that with nostalgia the really bad voice acting so it kind of gave it its place yeah it really did and uh and the system uh had two megs of it's on uh, ceiling of onboard RAM and one meg of video RAM. Now the significant thing about the two megs of, of the onboard RAM and the one meg of video RAM is that was a lot more than the, the Nintendo 64 had, which is why uh, Nintendo 64 games had so much trouble being uh, a large epic game and having an open world. It could do 3D, but the you lack of space on the cartridge killed it. Yeah, the world couldn't be open the way that a lot of PlayStation games were able to do because of the extra RAM. And another thing with that is that with the storage medium of CD, they could also go multiple disc. Yeah, like that, a lot of, like SquareSoft did. That was crucial. I mean, the biggest super, uh, Nintendo 64 game could be around 32 megabytes of space. The biggest PlayStation game could be... 3.2 gigabytes. I mean, that is just a ridiculous amount of difference. And uh, and it cost them nothing to do. If you wanted to do a cartridge game on two cartridges, that's going to be an 80 to to $100 game. Fortunately, no one ever tried that. Uh, isn't that which, impossible? It's, Unless you have a lot of storage RAM to hold the... I've never seen a multi-cart game. They they planned it. Uh, that's how Final Fantasy was going to be. Now we'll we'll delve into this. We didn't get into it in uh, in Final Fantasy VII, but we'll go ahead and jump into it. Final Fantasy VII <coughs> was originally uh, planned and designed for the Nintendo 64, but did not uh, go very far into development before they realized they were going to have to release a bunch of cartridges in order to get what they wanted on it. It was impossible. Wasn't it 13? Some exactly? ridiculous number. I mean, yeah. who knows what it would have been. It was pointless. It would have cost $600 for the game to buy it. Not that people wouldn't have bought it for that price. You know, but, but, but it, it wouldn't have worked, or else it would have been severely nerfed. Yeah. And so that's where uh, Square quickly jumped to the PlayStation because they could do the kind of epic tales that sakaguchi son and uh, the rest of Square wanted to produce, and all these other companies that would uh, the follow suit. So that that was crucial. Was uh, was the CD format giving so much more space? And Nintendo had their reasoning for that, uh, mainly being control of the medium. They de they produced the cartridges, so you had to go through them to get the cartridge made. And on top of that, piracy. It was a lot harder to create a. Uh, machine that would dump a cartridge than uh, than pirate a CD, but yeah. Now we're going to move where that on went. to another. Well, let's finish this boss fight here. Let's check out this boss. So uh, the CD definitely uh, replaced the cartridge effectively with this system. I think. A world under siege where the baddest bosses rule. Who will save us? Mega Man! Join him on his ultimate quest in 3D! Who are his friends? Who are his enemies? Danger ducks around every corner! Mega Man uses awesome firepower to battle diabolical forces! Amazing home stop blasting action! Who can save the cities from destruction? Don't call a plumber! It's all in a day's work for Mega Man! Let's do it! Welcome! You can't hear. Stop, drop. 